welcome to the EU Matters podcast, brought to you by EU Watch. We are an NGO committed to encouraging debate about the European Union and its policies. In this episode, we focus on the state of relations between Turkey and the EU. Recently, Recep Tayyip Erdogan won re-election as president of Turkey. He has been in power for more than 20 years. But what does that mean for Europe? We speak with Dimitar Bechev, author of the book Turkey under Erdogan, How a Country Turned from Democracy in the West. Dimitar Bechev is a lecturer at Oxford University and a visiting scholar at the think tank Carnegie Europe. Dimitar, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, um, I wanted to ask you a few questions regarding the um, relationship between Turkey and the European Union in the wake of the re-election of uh, President uh, Recep Erdogan uh, recently. First question maybe, what do you think will this mean for Europe-Turkey relations, if anything? Well, I think it's more of the same, really. Um, So it doesn't uh, come as a game changer of any sort. The relationship is pretty bad. Uh, it has been the case for the past what seven to eight years, uh, but it's not abysmal because uh, for all the frictions and problems, there is a certain resilience. You can see it in um, the continued importance of the EU uh, on the economy side as a main trading partner, especially on Turkish exports, and as an investment partner for Turkey. Uh, support for Turkish for membership in the EU is relatively high, which is a function of economic trouble in Turkey. Uh, and also the EU needs Turkey on the migration side. And going forward, I think Turkey will be important uh, in the effort to combat climate change too. So it's not a perfect relationship, to put it mildly. Uh, but I don't see Erdogan's re-election as uh, leading to a rupture, despite some people uh, having a very somber view of uh, the way things are going. What what would have happened had uh, Kilic uh, Daroglu uh, won that election? He was billed as the pro-European candidate, as the one who would have reinvigorated the, the accession uh, negotiations uh, and so on. Uh, Let's maybe just imagine for a second what would have happened at the okay. other side. What would have happened um, on the substantive side is uh, some of the political prisoners w- would have been released, like Osman Kavala, uh, which would be really would have been important. Um, these are people um, stuck in jail on spurious charges, and in such case uh, they'll have given. Uh, European decision makers enough justification to open discussions on updating the customs union, which is something that Turkey is keen on uh, to include services as well as agriculture in the existing customs union. Uh, but it's not happening, and um, and therefore um, this positive scenario uh, is, is obviously not materializing. Um, maybe on the negative side, uh, I don't think Kulis Darulu would have um, dramatically revised uh, Turkey's policy in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, which would have created risks vis-a-vis Cyprus and Greece um, that definitely spill over into the overall EU-Turkish relationship. Mm-hmm. But would you say the enlargement uh, discussion inside Turkey is still alive? Is it still uh, an option, even even though there is a lot of skepticism on the European side that Turkey should eventually become a member of the EU? But is it still a realistic? I don't think it's alive. Honestly, I, I don't think it's alive. It has been the case for a long time, certainly after 2011, maybe after Sarkozy came to power in 2007. Uh, but neither side has interest to terminate the negotiations. It's a perverse situation. Um, actually, Erdogan probably wants the EU to um, pull the plug, as it were, in which case he'll have a justification to say it's not on us, it's on them, they don't want us. And likewise, uh, 
EU certain EU members prefer that Erdogan should terminate uh, the negotiations, though others uh, have a different view. They see some value, at least in the facade of negotiations. But the end result is these talks are still on the table formally and nothing is happening really. Um, the, the action is elsewhere, again, customs union, the migration deal, and a number of other tangential policies. Does the EU have any leverage over what is happening inside Turkey? On the, you mentioned the prisoner uh, question, but also the other questions. Or is there is it gone, the leverage? It's um, mostly gone. It's mostly over. Um, we don't live in the same era as in the golden days in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And um, it's very uh, telling that uh, during the campaign, nobody referred to the EU as an anchor. And the EU governments were very circumspect. They really want to uh, take a stand because we have been seen as interference and be counterproductive. Um, but having said that, um, the EU is a magnet and there is value, even if without um, exercising political leverage, you can play with conditionality and the fact that their conditions attached to visa liberalization, their conditions attached to the updating of the customs union um, speaks to the, the power of the EU to, to push. And there's also conditionality attached to um, climate change and the carbon border adjustment mechanism is about to kick in in 2026. And it's not strictly speaking about human rights or democracy, but it will put pressure on Turkish institutions to adapt and to uh, implement policies in line with EU's preferences. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't just write off EU's power to put forward demands and conditions. Has the uh, re-election, uh, or maybe phrase it differently, Erdogan in the past, he looked more towards the South, towards the Muslim world, towards even towards Iran. Uh, would you say he could turn around again and look more towards Europe again, as he did maybe 20 years ago when he became prime minister at the beginning of, the, of, the, of his first uh, government? Or would you say those days are now over? I don't think there will be a turnaround. Ideologically, people like Erdogan um, feel proximity to the Middle East. And also they're um, beholden to this idea that the world is moving beyond the West. It's a multipolar world where Turkey is one of the poles. And in actual fact, it doesn't need to be either with Western Europe and the US uh, or with Russia or with China, it has to be on its own and to play with everyone, including the Middle East. That's 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 the vision. But there are some hard realities at the same time. Um, I mean, I entitled my book, the title is How Turkey Turned Away from the West. But again, the economy anchors Turkey in, in the West. On the import side, China and Russia uh, have a greater share than um, the EU. But on the export side, the EU is the market where Turkey can export. Um, you have the customs union and also you have NATO, which despite everything is the ultimate insurance policy for, for Turkey uh, facing Russia on, on the other side. So even if you want to be a regional power, uh, want to exert influence in the Middle East, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Asia, um, Europe, and the Western connection, I think, remains important. You cannot just undo uh, what has happened over decades, if not centuries. Mm. You mentioned the migration deal, which was sort of controversial in Europe as well. Uh, um, is that a model for other countries now that in the, in the region, the EU, that the EU will seek to, to maybe not impose, but at least to, to get similar arrangements with other with other countries in the region, and has that deal helped Erdogan also to stabilize his own uh, power in Turkey, or is it overrated in terms of what he gained from from this uh, from this deal uh, eight years ago? On the first question, I think it, it could be a model, and you see some 
um, thinking going on or political momentum building in this direction. Um, Meloni, the Italian prime minister, went to Tunisia. And you see governments in North Africa trying to also get the same treatment as Turkey, get um, money in exchange of, uh, to, co to commitments on curtailing migration. On how much Erdogan got out of it, yeah, of course, the money is not insignificant, especially in time of uh, economic disruption. And Turkey also faces now uh, added bill related to the earthquake. Uh, and Turkey has done a great job in housing close to 4 million refugees, primarily from uh, Syria, but also Afghanistan and other places. So it's not for nothing. I'm not sure it has stabilized the regime, because one thing that is widespread in Turkey is the resentment. Um, 10 years ago, um, at the beginning of the Arab Spring, or 12 years ago when it started, everyone... All, receive Syrians with open hands. Now, political parties are all bidding one another who send more refugees back to, to Syria. And Erdogan looks very keen to restore relations to Damascus, you know, to start sending um, people back, if, it, if that's feasible at all. So, no, the refugee uh, issue in Turkey has exacerbated uh, tensions in society. Uh, especially at a time where the economy is not doing very well. Mm. As Erdogan, 20 years of Erdogan, has, has Turkey's democracy disappeared or will it disappear? Uh, was that the last free election, as some people have said, uh, and then it will be further downhill from there, or is that uh, too early to tell? Well, I think it's the million dollar question. The Turkish democracy has shown resilience uh, because. You cannot just erase easily 70 years of competitive elections. Despite all the defects, the flaws that you always had, um, an imperfect democracy at best. But people are accustomed to the fact that their vote counts. They take part in political parties. The membership is, is quite high. Uh, the political parties are real. They represent ideologies. You might dislike the ideologies, but uh, it's not a fake operation as you have in Russia and other parts of Eurasia. Uh, but after as many years under Erdogan, the playing field is so unequal and his regime becomes so much entrenched. So we've come to the point where you can question the um, notion of free elections. We know the elections were never fair because of uh, all those factors, um, access to media, access to state resources. But maybe we've come to also question next time around our election play on this other metric. And maybe one telling episode will be the forthcoming local election next year uh, in the spring. And we'll be pushing really hard to uh, regain Istanbul uh, and Ankara. And those big cities he lost in 2019. If it is done in a relatively transparent way without rigging the votes, maybe using the media, using ways to divide the opposition, um, that will be a more positive scenario. But if uh, power is transferred back to the presidential palace, uh, those um, huge municipalities where a lot of money and resources are distributed. So they matter to AKP. If power is transferred in uh, illegitimate ways, that will be really bad for whatever remains of the democratic system. Longer term, I'm optimistic about Turkey that um, eventually, once Erdogan is not there anymore, it will revert to um, this kind of unconsolidated democratic system you used to have. Uh, without the rule of law, without transparency, uh, with a huge state capture problem, but still with elections that are free and relatively fair. And mm. eventually we'll get back there, I think. Was this election free and fair? Or in, in, in comparison to previous elections? Uh... It was not fair. We don't know how free it was because we don't have the full data. For instance, in many, a huge number of rural and small towns 
um, polling stations, you didn't have opposition observers. It speaks not only about the government, it also speaks to the opposition's incompetence and uh, to build up the operation. But again, it's it's not easy to fight such a regime where the stacks, uh, where the odds are stacked against you uh, in, in many respects. Um, were you surprised about the, the outcome, the 52 I was surprised days? because all the polls suggested that the, the difference would be much uh, more narrow. I suspected that might be, there might be some hidden Erdogan vote, but he won by a healthy margin. And my suspicion is that he didn't win by rigging the election. Maybe he he did. He just played all the hands he has. Uh, because again, the system, the setup, favors the incumbent uh, in those hybrid regimes. Last question. Uh, if you would look at the challenges that the European Union has with Russia at the moment uh, and with other climate change, for example, you mentioned uh, energy supply. Uh, does Europe need Turkey? Does Europe need Erdogan more than vice versa? I think it's a mutual dependence. Yeah, short term, we do need Turkey. Uh, energy would be a good example because Azerbaijan now has become a supplier. Of course, Azeri gas cannot replace Russian gas. Uh, but Turkey is a transit country. And, and my own country, Bulgaria, that was cut off from Russian supplies now gets one third of its gas from the Azeris and without Turkey and Greece, that's possible. Um, same dependence on controlling migration, definitely. Uh, but it's not that EU has no leverage. Uh, it does. And because of the economic heft the EU has uh, there. So very often um, commentators, especially in media, uh, tend to portray Erdogan as 12 feet tall. And that's uh, not the case. Even when he tried to play tough, as in 2020, when he sent migrants to the Turkish Greek border, th this didn't result in um, EU caving in. On the contrary, um, Greece, with help from Frontex, managed to beef up its, its, its border. And the sad part, of course, is that the migrants themselves were victimized by port sites both the Greeks and the Turks. So human rights uh, was compromised in this process. Uh, but the EU is not weak. Uh, it has um, a lot of power and economy regulation, and it can also dictate um, conditions to, to Turkey. So I see it as a much more equal relationship uh, where both sides have some strategic bargaining power uh, but uh, they have also overlapping interests and also they have conflicting interests too. Thank you very much, Ingitar. My pleasure.